Greetings to all of you as uh, we begin our worship today. We um, want you to be aware that this is our second week um, as we address the topics on, from the book, The Jesus Challenge. We're pondering the meaning first of the great commandment that we are to love God, and uh, that's what we looked at carefully last week, loving God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And this week, we are looking at uh, what it means to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. Next week, we will spend time on a final verse of Scripture, which is related to these commandments, which is, how do we go about the business of loving our enemy? Or thinking ahead, uh, perhaps, how do we love the unlovable? You won't want to miss it. We have uh, had our Zoom session on this topic the past Tuesday evening. We thank all of who tuned in, and we encourage others to join us this week for our final Zoom session on the book, The Jesus Challenge. What we need from you is an email address. Uh, this allows us to send you an invitation. Uh, we ask that you would then let us know, and we will get you hooked up. It's been quite some time since we have celebrated Holy Communion, and I want you to know that on September the 13th, we'll be sharing the elements of the bread and the cup, the body and blood of Christ. For those of you worshiping via the internet, you will want to be sure to have the elements ready so that you may partake at the proper time. Again, that's two weeks from today on September 13th. It took us a little longer to get the worship service posted last week. We want to thank everyone for your patience. Uh, we are praying that that's behind us. Uh, my mother got a little bit worried about things and gave me a call making sure that I was okay. And I assured her that all was well. We were just having a struggle uh, getting things uh, onto, the, uh, onto the website. So uh, all is well, and uh, th again, thank you for your patience. As the schools are gearing up, or have, some have begun, and uh, the Dallas Town School District will begin soon, we're, of course, encouraging you to pray. These are hard, hard days of decision. But I also want you to pray for our preschool because we are about to begin uh, the preschool for those who are enrolled. We must follow the same protocols as the local school districts and we will be keeping safety as our measure. Your prayers can help and uh, so we will be grateful. Lastly, I'm in trouble. <laughs> I'm in trouble because I shared in worship that I have five Hawaiian shirts and that I had used them all and I didn't want to recycle them and bore you with the same old series of shirts. And then someone heard that as a plea for more Hawaiian shirts. And so I want to thank Richard and Joanne Anderson for their gift of two shirts to add to my collection. One of them I'm wearing today. The other I'm going to be getting out for next week. You've come to enjoy them, I think. And it does lend itself to a little bit of humor as we begin our worship services. So I'm in trouble if you begin to think that I am in need because I can see a whole avalanche of Hawaiian shirts coming my way. And I don't need that. I don't need that. I can't imagine any more of these shirts in my closet. And more importantly, neither can my wife, Kathy. With that bit of humor, let's worship the living God.
Let us pray. Living and loving God, there's not a day goes by when we do not experience the joy of the love that you share with us. Oh, sometimes it seems hard to discover that love, for sometimes our days are difficult. Nevertheless, your love transcends those difficulties and calls us to faith. Thank you, O oh Father, for your love, for your kindness, for your caring, and make us a people who care as well. Amen. Please join me in the call to prayer and praise. What commandment is first of all? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. What is the second great commandment? You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Praise the Lord. The Lord's name be praised. Let us pray together. Holy God, as the light of the sun is transformed by plants into energy, so we transform your divine light into love and service. Open our hearts so we may draw down the light. Fill us with your presence and turn our acts of kindness, words of blessing, and gifts of service into light for others. Amen. May we join in a time of silent prayer and meditation.
And again, let us pray together. O oh God, our lives reach out in ever-widening circles. Bless us in each one of them. Bless us in our homes and help us to remember all that we owe to them. Bless us in the place where we work and help us to be workers who will never need to be ashamed of anything we do or make. Bless us in our towns and help us to put much and more into the life of the community than we take out. Bless us in our church. Make us in our church to worship with reverence and with gladness, to serve the church with whatever gifts we have. Bless us in our country and help us to study, to learn, and to train that we may be good citizens of it. Bless us in the world. And in our day, bind the nations together in peace. Amen. Let us pray. God of power and might, we come to this place of sanctuary from the world in the hope that you would give us discernment and peace. Our world is filled with strife and greed. We pray for the victims of war. We pray for our government. We pray for the forgotten and the lost. Help us to be a people who make a difference not only through our prayers, but by our votes and by our hopes, but also by our witness to the world. Teach us to treat others as we would be treated. Help to keep us from depersonalize those we do not know and treating them as statistics. Help us to remember that each person has feelings and hopes and no one is so foreign that he or she deserves to be forgotten. Grant us the wisdom and power to take from this sanctuary the will to make a difference in the lives of our neighbors, all of them, all of them, both where we are and among those whom we do not know. We pray in Jesus' name, 
remembering how he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As the children gather around, I want to share a, a few words with them, and uh, I want to begin by uh, putting a picture of uh, this fellow up in front of him. Uh, he's not on television anymore, but uh, he has a uh, character that's on television by the name of Daniel Tiger. This is Mr. Rogers. This is Mr. Rogers, and he had a television show that was known as Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. And every show began the same way. Mr. Rogers would come in through the door of his house. He would take off his jacket and his shoes. And then he would put on his sweater and comfortable tennis shoes, and he sang a song 
called Won't You Be My Neighbor? And it goes like this. <clears throat> it's a beautiful day in the neighborhood, a beautiful day for a neighbor. Would you be mine? Could you be mine? And then it ended like this. Won't you be my neighbor? Won't you please? Won't you please? Please won't you be my neighbor? Well, Mr. Rogers died several years ago, but he had millions and millions of neighbors all over the world, and he was really very famous. He never thought of himself as a TV star. He lived in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. But he did say, I always thought I was a neighbor for anyone who would come for a visit on the television show. And Mr. Rogers knew what it meant to be a good neighbor. One day there was a, a time when a lawyer was uh, asking Jesus, was asking Jesus, uh, what is the greatest of the laws? And the lawyer, uh, Jesus was ready for this question, so he asked the lawyer, he said, uh, well, you know the law, why don't you tell me what you think? And the lawyer answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said, you're right, you're right, do this and you will live. But the man wanted to make himself look good, and so he asked Jesus another question. Who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? And to answer this question, Jesus told a very wonderful story called the Good Samaritan. Now, before we tell the story of the Good Samaritan, I want you to uh, be reminded that we're talking about two loves. One is that you and I are supposed to love God. Love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And we're supposed to love our neighbor. Two loves. Two loves that we should never, ever forget. Love God and love neighbor. Well, when the lawyer asked uh, Jesus about uh, who is my neighbor, Jesus, as I said, told the story of the Good Samaritan. There was a man who was going up the road from Jericho to Jerusalem, called the Jericho Road. And while he was on his way, he was attacked by robbers. And they beat him up, took all that he had, uh, stripped him of his clothes, and left him for dead on the side of the road. A priest came by. Now, a priest is kind of like a pastor. Uh, he works in the, the, uh, the synagogue, or he works at the temple in Jerusalem. And whatever, you would think that he would, I know, I would think I would try to stop and help. But this fellow, this priest saw the man and saw him bleeding and thought, maybe he's dead and uh, I better not go over there. So he crossed over to the other side of the road and kept on going. Then there was another man who was also a person who worked in the temple. He was called a Levite. The Levite saw the man, and he too crossed over the side of the road and, and went by without helping him. Finally, a man from Samaria came along, and we, when he saw this man hurting so badly, he stopped. He helped him, put some medicine on his wounds, wrapped him with bandages, and that's not all. He put the man on his own donkey and carried him to an inn where he took care of him. The next day, he gave the innkeeper some money and told him to take care of the man, give him anything that he needs. If it costs more than I have given you, the next time I stop by here, I'll pay you. I'll pay you what is owed. Then Jesus asked, which of these three men was neighbor to the man who was attacked by robbers? And of course, you and I know the answer. The one who helped. The one who took care of this poor man that was beaten up, who was robbed and left for dead. That is how we show that we are a neighbor. That's how Mr. Rogers felt about all the people that he touched with his life, asking them to be his neighbor. You're my neighbor. I'm your neighbor. I'll take care of you if I know that you're in trouble, and I hope that you'll take care of me when I'm in trouble. You can pray for me. 
you can share your 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 thoughts and impressions you can you can tell me the things that you want for me to know and I hope I can do the same with you you're my neighbor and I am your neighbor it's a wonderful thought that's how we get along that's how we get along and uh, if you're ever in need I hope that you'll come and speak with me so that I can be of help that's what a pastor does that's what a good neighbor does. Let's pray. Dear God, this is a very, very important lesson. For when it all boils down, all of us are neighbors to one another. And we thank you that you called us to live in this neighborhood called the church, where we can take care of one another and share our stories Thank you for that great privilege. Amen. As we think of uh, ourselves and our circumstances as we worship online, I trust that you find ways to come to the moment of the offering with, with a sense of responsibility, but also with a sense of our task as stewards of what God has given to us. We seem to repeat this theme again and again, but it is the theme that has most to do with our giving. And so let's be careful. Let's find ways to give, whether virtually through the uh, website or, or through your phone and the Give Plus app or mailing in your check. We've been doing okay, and we need to continue to challenge ourselves to give, to give for the work of God in our community. As I mentioned before, we've extended our work uh, to especially focus in on what it means to uh, feed others who have hunger needs. There are many families who are in trouble because of unemployment and for other reasons, and uh, uh, we have given to the food bank. Uh, to the uh, Red Lion uh, community uh, caring uh, uh, vision that is held there. Uh, we have uh, also then sent uh, a check recently to Costa Rica to help those folks uh, through um, a mission with, uh, with uh, Lindsay Walker Lasasso. And uh, the Futuro Brillante is uh, the name of that mission. We're grateful to participate in these because it delivers food. That is an essential. Let us pray. Almighty God, we are before you once more. We're taking stock of how you have blessed us. And in our thanksgiving, we respond by blessing others. That was the original covenant. You said to Abraham, I will bless you so that you will be a blessing. Help us to take that seriously. It's a key understanding of what it means to be Christian. Help us, we pray, to give. Amen. You're the God of this city. You're the King of these people. You're the Lord of this nation. You are. You're the light in this darkness. You're the hope to the hopeless. You're the peace to the restless. You are. There is no like God.
The scripture lesson today is from Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 37. May we join in reading together. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is it written in the law? Jesus replied. How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him and of his clothes beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road when he saw the man. He passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Do you recall the question that I asked as we began last week with regard to, do you really love God? 
I asked rather simply, what characteristics are there in your life that when somebody sees you and watches you, they would see by your lifestyle that you love God? A secondary question might be, when you look for characteristics in other people, how would you know that that person loves God? This past week I ran across a little story that tells how important it is that we, if we say we love God, then we better be sure that our lives reflect that love. I shared this with the 15 persons who were able to connect with the Zoom meeting this past Tuesday. By the way, if you want to connect uh, this Tuesday, please uh, hand me your email address. Those attending have said that they have enjoyed it. So join us as we continue the Jesus Challenge. N now the story. A man was driving down a busy street, followed by an impatient, stressed out woman. He knew that because she was closely tailgating him. Suddenly the light turned yellow just in front of him and he did what was the right thing and stopped before the crosswalk. Oh, he could have beaten the red light, but accelerating through the intersection, but, but he didn't. The tailgating woman went ballistic. She laid into her horn again and again, screaming in frustration and offering nasty gestures to indicate her displeasure that she had missed her chance to get through the intersection. In the middle of her ranting, she heard a tap on her window and looked up into the face of a rather serious looking police officer. The officer ordered her to exit the car with her hands up. <laughs> he took her to the police station and had her searched and fingerprinted and photographed. After all that, he put her in a holding cell. After a couple hours, another police officer released her and escorted her back to the booking desk where the arresting officer waited with her personal effects. He apologized to the woman saying, I'm very sorry for this mistake. You see, when I pulled up behind your car, you were blowing your horn and making obscene gestures to the guy in front of you and cursing a blue streak at him as he obeyed the law. Then I noticed the What Would Jesus Do bumper sticker. I saw the Choose Life license plate holder. Then there was another bumper sticker that said, Follow me to Sunday school, which was right under a chrome-plated Christian fish emblem on the trunk. Naturally, watching all of this, I assumed that you had stolen that car. I love this story because it rather simply communicates the truth that a lot of us who claim to be Christians don't always act like Christians. So look, men and women, where have you blown it? And this story illustrates that either we don't know how to truly demonstrate our love for God or we get snagged by life, getting ourselves into situations where showing that we live in love with God becomes difficult. Now, I'm not trying to say that we're going to live the perfect life because we are fallen, we are fallible, we are imperfect. But John Wesley suggested that we should be moving on, going on to perfection, he called it. Which is to say that as time passes, you and I should be doing better at it. Our faith should impact our lives, every part of our lives. There was a young man who said, if all my religion is going to do is change my Sunday schedule, then I am not interested. I'm not interested. I want something that is going to change my finances, my relationships, change the way I work, the way I treat my family, the way I use my time, and the way I treat others. This young man got it. For instance, our faith should indeed have significant impact on how we spend our money. The fact that the average American Christian gives less than 2% of his or her income to church or for charity is a serious problem. If we take our faith seriously, we all spend far less on our, we will spend far less on ourselves and far more on the work of the church. Christians should make a huge impact on every aspect of life. And isn't this the point of the parable? of the Good Samaritan. 
Luke's version of the interchange between Jesus and the lawyer is very different than that of Matthew and Mark. And personally, I like the drama in Luke. The question is different. Rather than asked, what is the greatest of the laws, Jesus is asked, how might I inherit eternal life? This is an important question. I pray that you know the answer. But Jesus tosses the question back at the lawyer as if to say, well, you're a lawyer. You know what you're up to. You're a scholar. How do you read? And the lawyer gives the very appropriate answer. As we read together, quoting Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5, the Shema, and then adding Leviticus 19.18, love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus commended his answer and said, do this and you will live. Now, we could spend a bit more time to share information about Samaritans and how the Jews hated the Samaritans and how the Samaritans hated the Jews. Or we could spend some time talking about the 17-mile pathway through the nooks, the rocks, the ravines that led from Jericho to Jerusalem and how it was known as the Bloody Way or the Path of Blood. And we wonder what this guy was doing traveling this dangerous road by himself where robbers could so easily take advantage of him. Why was he alone? But let's get to the parable content. The man lies bleeding, left for dead on the side of the road. First comes the priest, who sees the man, crosses over, and passes by on the other side. Then comes a Levite. He too, upon seeing the man, chooses to cross over and passes by. We could make excuses for these two guys, I suppose, but the fact of the matter is that these two temple officers, very religious types, the kind that would have a bumper sticker on the back of their donkeys behind saying, I love God, these two guys passed by, even though you would have expected them to be moved by compassion. After all, they are lovers of God. They represent one kind of people, those who do not care, or at least care enough to put it into action. But the Samaritan, racially hated by any self-respecting Jew, saw the man, had compassion on him, cleansed and bound up his wounds, put him on his donkey, probably with no bumper sticker, and carried him to the nearest inn. There he paid for the cost of his care and promised to pay for any additional amount that might be required upon his return. Then, Jesus clinched the parable with the question, Which of these three was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? And of course you know the answer. The one who showed mercy on him, came the lawyer's reply. Go and do likewise. Jesus closes. Go and do. It's a doing thing. It means action. I love Justin LaRosa's sequence of thought as he describes what it means to love your neighbor. He says, as we look at the Good Samaritan, we see a man who saw someone suffering. That's first. You see someone suffering. Then you become filled with compassion. Then you draw near to the man, and then he acted. He acted, binding up his wounds, taking him to the inn where he would be cared for. And La Rosa says, if we are to go and do likewise, then we must faithfully and forever follow the same formula. See those who suffer, experience compassion for others, and then even those who are outside of our circles, and then we must draw near, and then we must act. We must act. It's a doing thing. A doing thing. Yes, in this parable we see two kinds of people. Those who care, and those who don't. So which side of this rather simply constructed fence will you be on today? Which side? It's easier not to care than to care. Was this a first century Gallup poll where two out of three people will not really care? 
while one-third of the people will? On a busy street, a small boy was struggling to get his tricycle over the curb. Many people had already passed by walking when a truck driver pulled over. The driver got out of the cab and went to the boy. Still, he was struggling with his tricycle. He scooped up both the bicycle and the, the, and the boy and with a pleasant smile said, Are you having a little trouble, Sonny? Now the boy was on the sidewalk and the truck driver patted him on the head, jumped back into the truck and was on his way as the boy pedaled on down the sidewalk. I was close enough but had not noticed the boy in his struggle until I heard the truck's brakes applied. And this is a simple thing, it was a little thing, but the truck driver saw it, was drawn to it, and did it, while I and many others did not. A small group of college students were on a study tour to Haiti, the poorest nation in the Western Hemisphere. The professor knew a priest who ministered to an incredibly poor slum after the terrible earthquake some years ago. 40,000 people squeezed into a little more than 100 acres. Imagine that. There was squalor and suffering everywhere. One morning, the priest awakened the small group of students and said, I want you to see something. They followed him through the paths along the lean twos and the shacks. There was a flu epidemic. Now, this was the normal flu epidemic, not the coronavirus. But when the normal flu hits our community, usually children miss school. In Haiti, these malnourished children die. They die. As they walked, mothers emerged from their shacks, carrying in their arms the small corpses of children who had died during the night. They followed those mothers then to the edge of the slum where there was a ditch dug. As tenderly as dignity would allow, those mothers laid their small children in the ditch. The priest said the words that he could, offering prayers for the burial of the dead. And through it all, the mothers wept and screamed in their grief. When the ditch was covered over, the professor leading the trip remembered the tears in the eyes of the students. In particular, there was one burly basketball player with fists clenched, lips trembling, and tears rolling down his cheeks. They learned that day what it meant to turn love for neighbor into action. And they learned that it might just mean that their hearts would be broken. Two kinds of people, those who care and those who don't. A last word. There are those who give lip service to caring, who say that they do care. Yes, sir, e Bob, love God and love neighbor, that's me but they don't do it. And there are those who turn love into action. Which are you? And which am I? Master, how might I inherit eternal life? Love God and neighbor as myself. Yes, that's the correct answer. That's the right answer. Do this. Do this. Do this and you will live. Will we?
May the grace, mercy, peace, and the love of God rest and abide with us all, now and forevermore. Amen.